Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, real quick before we dive into the text, um, Miss uh, Angelica, who's been a guest of ours frequently uh, and is a, a new sister in Christ, is heading back to that other college that's near Durham, North Carolina. No, I'm just kidding. She's heading back to Chapel Hill when? This afternoon? Tomorrow? This afternoon? So um, as you uh, see her on her way out, just make sure uh, you say, uh, see you soon, not goodbye, right, Mike Heber? Uh, she'll hopefully, uh, she will, she'll be visiting uh, whenever she gets some time off from Chapel Hill, which who wouldn't want to do that? You know, be able to leave that place and get to somewhere that's safe. Uh, I had to, I had to. Uh, so just make sure you do that. So uh, our text this morning, if you have your Bible with you, will be Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. And it says there, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. That is Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. And as we continue in our series uh, about understanding faith, Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 1 and following, the whole chapter is designed uh, so that your personal faith, your private faith, will go. So what do I mean by private things? These things that he's going to talk about in Matthew chapter 6 are not things that are done uh, as part of the uh, religious routine, as, as someone would say. So in Matthew chapter 6 verse 1, he gives those people a warning. He says, hey, don't uh, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. And so as most of our uh, series has been from the Sermon on the Mount, we note, or should note, that this is still right there in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is in the process of deconstructing a mindset that was there in the first century. And so what he's going to say here, there are three personal, private disciplines that are mentioned here outside of what we would uh, normally call our normal spiritual routine that if practiced will help grow your faith. So these personal disciplines grow disciples. These personal disciplines grow disciples. And we're going to talk about two of those this morning and then one of those uh, tonight. And so what he says, this phrase, uh, in order to be seen by them, is used five times in this section. There are five times in this section where Jesus says, make sure you do this, or make sure you don't do this, so that you might not be seen by men. So what does he mean by all of that? Does that mean, hey, you know, when they pass the plate, I have to make sure that nobody sees it. Remember, he's not talking about things that are done in public, like going to the temple, like offering sacrifices. He's talking about those personal things that we do, as we would say in a modern culture, outside of the regular church assembly. Uh, and he notes uh, one of those in the very first chapter. Now, before we get, or in the second verse, now before we get there, we have to understand something about discipline. None of us like it. I don't know too many people uh, who, when disciplined, would say, man, that was fun. Uh, I can remember a story that I heard. Uh, I don't know, remember whether Caleb told this story or Pam told this story. But when Caleb and Hillary were really young, Caleb got in trouble. And it was, I don't remember whether it was Pam or Kurt, but they went to discipline him by spanking him. And they spanked him a couple times. And he looked at them, or that person, and said, is that all you got? Now, how do you think that went over? Uh, needless to say, he was sore after that to the point where he didn't enjoy it, right? And even as personal disciplines, 
There are things that you might do now that you couldn't stand to do then, but are like hobbies now. I can, for instance, I mentioned this morning, learning for me, class, school, in high school was atrocious for me. All I wanted to do was play sports and hang out with friends. But now, I thoroughly enjoy learning. And for some of y'all, whether that's, you know, the work that you do, maybe the job that you have used to be or stems from a discipline that you did because you were supposed to do that, but now has become a part of who you are. And that's the key to each one of these things. They start out as disciplines, things that uh, are delayed gratification. That's what discipline is, delayed gratification. If I do this now, I will reap the benefit of it later. And that's huge spiritually. Because what does that mean? That means growth. That means a closeness with God that it will later be present that maybe isn't there right now. And so the first discipline that he mentions in giving this speech in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, thus, when you give to the needy, remember he said, don't practice your righteousness to be seen by men. These are acts of charity, acts of righteousness. And so the first one he mentions is, hey, when you give to the needy, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. Now, is he literally talking about as you give to the needy, you know, taking your horn out from your back pocket or your satchel and start blowing it down, you know, you know, playing a blues jam, you know, down, you know, North Main Street in Jerusalem as you've given to somebody? No, that's not what he's talking about. He's, what he's saying here is as you give to the needy, separate and apart from what you would give at the temple, right, as they had the tithe, which was seen as this type of tax. It was something that you were obligated to give. Separate and apart from that, when you give to the needy, make sure you're not bragging about that. Make sure that the motivation behind your giving to the needy isn't so that people will say, there's a the guy that gives to the needy. I mean, think about that for a second. What kind of reputation would that have made for somebody in the first century. They would have walked down the street and everybody would have seen, well, here comes Bob or Jim or Sally or Sue. And you know what? They give to the needy. And Bob, Jim, Sally or Sue would walk by and be like, you're right. I do give to the needy. And just to show you that I give to the needy, here, I'm going to give to the needy. <laughs> right? And so what that does is it wells up a pride within us that makes us the centerpiece, the one to be worshipped, the, the one that gives our, that out of what we have given then requires people to flood us with a pat on the back. And so he says, now look at the result of this, don't do this as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the street. That's a direct attack on the Pharisee and the Sadducee that they may be seen by others truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. Now watch verse three and four. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now they've received their reward in full because the reason for their giving is so that they might be honored by men. They want that gratification. They want their name on the billboard. They want their name, you know, in the, in the pamphlet that says top five givers in Jerusalem. That's the driving force behind why they do what they do. And what Jesus said is if that's your motive towards the poor, if that's why you give to the needy, then guess what? You've already received your reward in full because you've already gained the honor of men. And when we stack that up, which would we rather have? Which should we drive after? Which should we pursue? The honor of men or the honor of God that comes out of a relationship with him? See, their giving is on the basis of a relationship with people, not with God. And so, he lets them know in full 
They've received their reward in full. There's nothing left for them to gain by their giving to the poor. Because they see the poor as an instrument to be used for their own self-gratification, not people to be pursued through their giving. Our giving to the needy and our giving to the poor is not so that we can walk around and tell people, I gave to a poor person on the side of the street, look how great I am. They're not just people to be pitied. They are people to be pursued. That our giving to them doesn't just draw them closer to us. It draws them and us closer to God. And they see that giving and they say, why? And we say, Jesus. And we see the attitude that God has for the poor. And in our giving, we are drawn closer to God. Because of not just who we give to, but why we do it. And note what he says in this first private discipline. He says, but when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And so there is this idea that as I give to the needy in secret and as I don't go boast about it and toot my own horn so that I might achieve the honor and the, uh, the pat on the back from men, there is a greater reward that stands on the other end of that that no man can touch. That there's no amount of reward people could pile on me that would compare in the reward of being honored by God. Now, how do we know that this is honor? Because notice what the reward entails in that verse is that they might be seen by men. Well, God sees the reason and the why and the who in everything that we do. And it even comes down to our private giving outside of basic, quote, church operations. And he says, if you give to the needy, if you place a premium on helping the disadvantaged within your neighborhood, within your community, within your state. However you do that, God sees that in private and honors people and will honor you. And what does that look like? I don't know. The text doesn't reveal. It doesn't say that based upon this giving to the needy, X will be poured down from heaven to you. But let me ask this question since we're on this point. What would it look like if we really believed that? See, what's so interesting about this text, specifically when it talks about giving, when it talks about stuff, is that he starts this section with giving. And then from verses 19 all the way through the end of chapter 6, he talks about stuff. He goes on to say that you can't serve both God and money. He goes on to talk about, hey, don't worry about the clothes that you will wear. Don't worry about the things that you will eat. And he, and, and Christ makes a very poignant point that the focus should not be on the money, but the focus should be on the kingdom. That if you focus on the kingdom, all of these things will be added unto you. So why is Jesus want to be involved with my money? Is God broke? No. See, here's the thing. God doesn't need my money. But here's what he understands about it. That just in, as in that day, as it is today, money is seen as the ultimate security blanket. 
How many times do we come across people who say, if I just had enough money, I wouldn't have to worry. But here's the funny thing about that. Isn't it interesting that the more money we gain, the more money we need? I've never, ever, even the late Steve Jobs, the founder and creator of Mac, I never once heard Steve Jobs say, you know what? I've got enough. I've never heard a sports star say, you know what? I know they're offering me $150 million, but I think I'll take the last contract, which was about $100 million short. So what's the point? The point is not that God needs your money or God needs my money. It's not that God is broke. It's that God wants our complete and total trust. And in order to do that, there has to be an exchange that takes place. See, if money is my ultimate security blanket, that means that God's not. And so that in my giving to the needy outside of, quote, basic, in this case, temple, in our case, church operations, when I do that, I am relinquishing my trust in money. I'm relinquishing the security that I find in money. I relinquish my, dare I say it, idol worship of money. Think about it. Why is it so important that, why do we see a green piece of paper with a bunch of dead presidents plus Benjamin Franklin? I mean, especially Benjamin Franklin. It's paper. And yet we place a high premium on it because society is so addicted to it. And Jesus says, both here and for the rest of the chapter following verse 19, that if you are all about money, if you are all about your 401k, if you are all about your job, you're not all about me. That's why Paul would write to Timothy that the love of money is the root of all types of evil. It's not bad to have money. It's bad to be addicted to it to the point where it takes the place of God. And so in this first personal discipline, if we would just relinquish some of that security, if we would relinquish some of that trust through giving to the needy, we would understand both that we would understand the mindset of how God views the needy, but also what it means to fully trust in God with our stuff, with who we are. Because if we give to the needy, and if we do it in secret, and if we do it not to seek the approval of men, God has promised us that we will be rewarded. And that reward is honor from God, but a closeness that says, God, this paper, this stuff, is not the end all be all, but you are. Because this is a private discipline that will grow disciples. And so the second personal discipline that he talks about, first he addresses what we view as our number one asset, money. And then he addresses the number one thing we view, we, we think we have most of, time. Now, it doesn't say it explicitly there, but watch what he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when you 
pray. Now, I want you to note something about that text, and I want you to write this in your Bible anywhere that you can find it near that verse. Notice the verse says, and when you pray, not if you do it. See, there's a big difference. See, Christ is already, given that he is speaking to a Jewish population, he is already assuming that these people do it. He doesn't have to beg them to pray. And so the question that we would ask this morning, that we should ask this morning, is this a matter of this is a part of who I am or is it man? It's not a matter of when I do it, it's do I even do it? Do I even pray? Now notice what he says about prayer. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. See, he used that in chapter, in chapter 6, in the same chapter, verses 1 through 4. He says, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. This is not saying that we shouldn't pray during service. This is not saying that you shouldn't stand in the street corner even and say a prayer. The point that Jesus is making is that the reason these people do it is the same reason that they give to the needy. Because they want people to say, hey... John over there prays. He's a praying kind of guy. And John says, you're right. Watch me. And he says, but when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Just do it to be seen. Truly, I say to you, oh, here's another key phrase. They have gained their reward in full. They have gotten exactly what they have hoped for, which is the approval of men. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father. Here's another parallel. Who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. You see the similar language between the first personal discipline and the second personal discipline? Once again, this is not talking about what takes place in church or what takes place in the temple. This talks about that time in which you have alone with God, which means Jesus is assuming here that people have carved out that time in their life to talk to Jesus or to talk to God. And the question I would ask all of us this morning is, do we? And for how long? Well, yeah, I pray, I pray all the time, you know, you know, to God. I mean, we eat every day, don't we? I mean, I do it at the dinner table. But is that private alone time? Or is that just the routine that we've gotten ourselves into out of simply monotony? See, God wants you to carve out time, not just to give to the needy, but to talk to Him. And this is practical in every single relationship that all of us are engaged in. See, we talk to people that we like and love. Right? I mean, that's exactly what we do. And, and to a degree, if we don't like or love somebody, we have a tendency not to talk to them. And so what makes us think that the person on the other end of that conversation or the other end of that relationship would be acceptable or would accept the idea that we love them yet we never say anything to them or we simply give them a passing word. We might be acquaintances, we might be co-workers, we might be students that sit in the same class, but would we really have a viable, intimate relationship with one another? What is a marriage if nobody talks to each other? What is a friendship if there's not that intimate interaction What is a relationship, a intimate relationship, a viable relationship, a relationship worth having if there is no time together? One of the reasons that we don't grow close to God is because you don't spend enough time with Him outside of a Sunday or a Wednesday 
talking to him. And just as any other relationship would become fragile and would fracture due to lack of communication, that would be the same thing for your personal relationship and my personal relationship with God as well. If I don't talk to him. See, I can go through the motions of saying prayer at dinner. I can go through the motions of, you know, when someone asks me to serve on the table to do that, when someone, you know, asks me to even say the opening prayer and the closing prayer, I can go through the motions of all that and let everybody know that I'm a prayer. But it's hollow and it's empty if there is no viable relationship. And so he says, go into your room, shut the door and pray to your father who sees in secret. And so the question would be, what's the benefit of this? Because that's how we normally operate. If there's an offer on the table, tell me what the benefit of it is. Well, it's not that every single prayer that you pray is going to be answered with a yes. It's not even that when you get alone with God, you're going to know all the exact words to say to Him. Maybe the benefit and the reward of private prayer with God is that you get to be in His presence. Alone, away from all the distractions and a place where you can come to the throne room of grace and just let God know what's on your heart. So that maybe in those moments where I don't know what to say, I can walk away from that private time and say, you know what? I might not know what to pray. But the Holy Spirit interceded for me and God knows. Maybe it's because in that moment of communication, you can be real with God in a way that you can't be real with everybody else. And so that in that reward, you are also honored by God that, he, that you would come before him and talk to him, but you are blessed by being in his presence. You are blessed by that communication and that relationship grows. And that far exceeds the reward for somebody just walking up to you and say, nice prayer. Because the benefit of that is God says, I'm here listening, my child. What? have to say. And he listens, and he hears, and he cares. And so those two private disciplines, if we practice them, they won't just be things we say, oh, well, I have to do, but there's a delayed gratification that as we give to the needy and as we pray in the presence of God, they no longer become something I have to force myself to do, but they over time become, of a, become a part of who I am. And in those private disciplines, you know what takes place? Change. My heart changes towards how I view money and my heart changes towards how I view people. And my prayer life changes, not just, it doesn't just consist of a dinner time prayer or when someone asks me to do it in church, it becomes a habit. It's no different than having a conversation with somebody who is in the flesh and in the bone. And it encourages me that God hears my prayer. It encourages me that even when I don't know what to pray, that the Father still hears And then from there, when someone hurts and when someone struggles, my first inclination is not to go to a self-help book. My first inclination is to grab that person by the hand or put my arm around their shoulder and say, let's pray. And in both of those things, my brothers and sisters grow us. They will shape us. And most importantly, they keep us from being religious robots. They grow us closer to God and they grow us 
as disciples. Not because somebody gives me a pat on the back, but because it's who we are. And that's what Jesus is teaching. And, and so this morning, the, the question at hand is, what is your private discipline life like? When was the last time outside of what we do here on Sunday morning and on Wednesday night did you give to the needy? When was the last time you looked for the needy person? And when was the last time you spent a significant amount of time in the 24 hour a day, 7 day a week hustle and bustle of all the things that you have to accomplish and all the things that you have to do and you say God I'm so busy. It's not as if God goes, oh well I'm sorry, I, I didn't know that. When was the last time you talked to him significantly by yourself? And so this is what I want us to do. I want us to make these two disciplines, and even the one we're going to talk about tonight, I hope you come back and, tonight and as we look at the third one. I want us to make these not just disciplines, not just habits. I want this to be a part of us. So the application is simple. Let's start today looking for the needy people and relinquishing that trust in money that we have. And let's start today, if we aren't already, carving out some time. Maybe earlier in the morning we have to wake up. Maybe we go to bed a little bit later. Maybe we, we take a significant time of our lunch break from work and we just sit with God and we talk to Him. And let's do that so that we can be the people that God wants us to be, so that we might grow. And most, uh, and one of the important things is so that we don't become religious Sunday only, Wednesday night only robots. If we do that, Christ has promised us that we will be honored and we will be given a reward that's greater anything that man can give us. Are we willing to do that? Let's think about these things this morning as we stand and as we sing.